my dear CBS ladies. Hope y'all have had a good week and a good weekend. And I'm just glad to see everybody back in Bible study because we sure need it these days, don't we? So before I begin this teaching, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, tonight, uh, Lord, we just ask for your mercy. Uh, please give us your wisdom and your understanding of this chapter in Daniel. Uh, help us to understand, Father. We open our hearts to your truth and to your teaching. We know that you are in control of all things. We know you work in all things for our good. Lord, I, I pray what I say pleases you and that is somehow helpful to others. And I pray it in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. So, I think Daniel's prayer is one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. What a wonderful example for us. You know, Daniel had been a steadfast and faithful servant of God for his whole life. He studied scripture. He prayed daily. And after reading Jeremiah's prophecy, Daniel realized that it was almost time for its fulfillment. Daniel was hopeful that uh, God would act soon to restore his people and his temple. Daniel confessed and repented of the sins of God's people. He begs God to listen, to forgive, and to act. God heard his prayer and sent Gabriel with an answer. We know that God answers and hears our prayers. So tonight I think we learn when you cry out to God through prayer, O oh Lord, listen, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, act, he does. So I've divided up the chapter into two sections. Uh, Chapter 9, verses 1 through 19, Daniel prays, uh, O Lord, listen, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, act. And then in verses 20 through 27, God sends Gabriel to tell Daniel what will happen in the future. So in the first 19 verses, Daniel prays this prayer in the first year of Darius, 538 B.C., this would have been about the same year that Belshazzar had his big party and the handwriting on the wall appeared. Daniel, who was probably in his 80s, had been reading the words of Jeremiah, who was one of his contemporaries. And Daniel understood that the desolation of the Jews would last about 70 years, that their captivity was about to end, and the people and the temple would be restored to Jerusalem in about two more years. Daniel prayed with an attitude of earnestness and humility, pleading with sackcloth and ashes. Daniel prays that for God's own sake, that he hear his plea. Daniel understands that God is merciful and that we do not deserve any answers to our prayers. Daniel acknowledges God's power and all of his righteous acts. He acknowledges the sin of him and all of the Jewish people. He prays for God to turn away his anger and turn away his wrath for what they deserve as punishment and for disobeying God. Daniel prays, O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, act. What a beautiful prayer. And that prayer, it kind of reminded me of what Billy Graham prayed many years ago, and, and it was aired on Paul Harvey, and it went like this. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good, but that is exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values. We have exploited the poor and called it lottery. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn and called it choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it politics. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O God, and know our hearts today. 
Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Amen. Billy Graham's words. Oh, gosh. Uh, we need to pray this prayer for our country and our people so that God will not remove himself from us and send us into captivity. You know, I, I kind of believe that many of us today are captives already. Captives to drugs and alcohol. Captives to pornography. Captives to food. Captives to vanity. Success. Captives to possessions. We are not captives like the Israelites were captives in a foreign land. But we are prisoners nonetheless. We have put all these things above Almighty God, haven't we? Our country has become more and more secular, removing God from all areas. I think we all should pray Daniel's prayer every day. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not. We need God right here, right now, more than ever in our lives and in our country. So Daniel was probably the most righteous man of his time. But when he prayed, he, he, he confessed his own sin along with those of all the other Jewish people. And like Daniel did, we should confess our own sinfulness instead of blaming others in times of adversity. We, we need to look first to our own sins and confess them to God. And Daniel knew how to pray. As he prayed, he fasted, he confessed his sins and pleaded that God would reveal his will. Daniel prayed with complete surrender to God and with complete openness to what God would say to him. What a great example. When you pray, do you speak openly to God? Are you listening for what he's telling you, for his reply? I just think we all should pray Daniel's prayer. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, act. Then moving to the second division, uh, God sends Gabriel to tell Daniel what will happen in the future. So just as soon as Daniel began to pray, God sent Gabriel to answer his prayer. The heavens were set in motion to answer his prayer. Oh, I love that. Gabriel tells Daniel that there's good news and bad news. The good news is that his prayer would be answered. The Jerusalem and the temple will be restored. The Messiah will soon come to that city and the temple that will be rebuilt. And the best news is that when the Messiah dies, he will be the final sacrifice for sins and no more blood will need to be shed for the forgiveness of sins. He will be the perfect sacrifice. But the bad news is that the Messiah will have to die in that city. And sadly... Many will not know the prophecies, so they will reject his atoning sacrifice. And because of this, the temple and Jerusalem will be destroyed once more. The 77s in this chapter that were decreed for the people and sanctuary stand for 70 periods of 70 years, or a total of 490 years. This means that the events described in this chapter were all fulfilled in the first century. Gabriel pinpointed the Messiah being on earth somewhere around 26 AD, which is thought by many to be about the time of Jesus' baptism, his anointing, when the Holy Spirit descended on him that we read about in John chapter 1, verse 32. Then Gabriel talks about the end times coming like a flood. Verse 26 tells of the prince that shall come. This is the Antichrist. That will be in the final seven years of the prophetic calendar that Gabriel gave Daniel. What is called the tribulation or the day of the Lord. So uh, Matthew 24 uh, verses 3 through 24 says that it will be a time of terrible suffering and will climax with the return of Jesus. So scholars say the event that will trigger this last seven-year period is the signing of a covenant between the Antichrist and the Jewish nation. At this time, the Antichrist will be a key political figure in Europe, one of the ten toes of the image 
in Daniel 2. And the little horn who emerges from the ten horns, ten horns in chapter 7, verse 8. After three and a half years, the Antichrist will break the covenant, seize the temple, and put his own image there, and will force the world to worship him. We read about this in 2 Thessalonians and Revelation 13. This is called the abomination of desolation, and Daniel is going to talk about it in chapter 11 and 12. This is what Jesus, and this is, Jesus says, will mark the midpoint of the tribulation period. This, quote, man of sin and, quote, son of perdition that we read about in 2 Thessalonians 2, who had deceived the world, will now reveal himself as a tool of Satan and cruel dictator. But, here's the good news. Christ will defeat him when he returns to establish his kingdom. And we read about this in Revelation uh, chapter 19. So, oh, if God has promised you something through his word, it will come to pass. Dr. John Val Walvrude served as president at uh, Dallas Seminary for 34 years and he was known as an authority on the area of Bible prophecy. He calculated after a very exhaustive study of the scriptures that half of the prophecies in the Bible have already, already literally been fulfilled. He proposed that if this was the case, then we could count on God to remain true to those promises that remain. Whether a promise for today or a promise regarding the eternal plan of God. Daniel uh, predicted in about 538 BC that Christ would come as Israel's promised Savior and Prince 483 years after the Persian Emperor would give the Jews authority to rebuild Jerusalem, which was then in ruins. This was clearly and definitely fulfilled hundreds of years later. So there are extensive prophecies dealing with individual nations and cities and with the course of history in general, all of which have been fulfilled. More than 300 prophecies were fulfilled by Christ himself at his first coming. Other prophecies deal with the spread of Christianity, as well as various false religions and many other subjects. We can trust the Word of God in the Bible. There is no other book, ancient or modern, like this. The vague and usually wrong prophecies of people like Gene Dixon, Nostradamus, Edgar Case, and others like him are not in the same category at all, and neither are other religious books such as the Koran, the Confucian Analects, and any other similar religious writing. Only the Bible manifests this remarkable prophetic evidence, and it does so on such a tremendous scale as to make absolutely absurd any explanation other than divine revelation. So, we must keep reading and studying God's holy word because it has many important things to tell us. So, how do we apply this? Our commentary is very helpful in understanding this passage. And it's still, how do we apply it? That's a good question. We know that Daniel was told about the coming of the, of the Messiah, and that came to pass. We know what was prophesied with the temple in Jerusalem came to pass. We can trust that what Gabriel tells Daniel will happen in the end times will come to pass. This is going to happen in God's time, not ours. And what are we to do in the meantime? Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, 22, talking about the end times. But he who endures to the end will be saved. So we must endure in this race we call life. And as we are running our race, we have to pray. Let's all agree to cry out to God in prayer. Oh Lord, listen. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, act. So in conclusion, thinking about Daniel. He could have been bitter and full of self-pity for having to bear the consequences of sinful people. He sure didn't deserve to be dragged from his homeland to a foreign land. But Daniel cared deeply for his people and his homeland and his God. 
He became a great leader in his time. So we live in days where no one wants to take responsibility for their actions, much less the actions of our fellow men. But that is exactly what Daniel did in this chapter. He knew Israel's history enough to know of God's faithfulness and Israel's sinfulness. And he didn't sugarcoat or make excuses or complain about their captivity. He fully named and owned the sins of his people. He appealed to God based on his goodness and his mercy and nothing else. Daniel stood in the gap for his people and his nation. That's what real leaders do. Gabriel came to tell Daniel to bring him further insight and understanding. When we move past our personal discomforts and we pray purposefully for the greater purposes of God, heaven moves and God responds. And didn't you love how Gabriel assures Daniel that he is greatly loved? Our city, our nation, our world, our people are desperate for God's help and salvation, whether they know it yet or not. So I was talking with my husband, Tim, about this prophecy, and I was trying to explain it to him. I was telling him about the 77s and the anointed one coming but not ruling and about the Antichrist coming in the end times. And he says, well, what else will happen in the end times? And I said, I don't know. And he says, so what else is new? We don't know when the end times and the tribulation will begin. But the Word of God has given us clues. We just have to remain alert and awake to see them. We can do like Daniel did. He looked to the Word of God for his answers, and he prayed to God, Lord, hear, Lord, forgive, Lord, act. We can do the same. Cry out to God through prayer. Oh, Lord, listen. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, act. So will you choose to pray like Daniel in repentance and wait expectantly? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this lesson in your beautiful holy word through Daniel. Thank you, Father, for how Daniel teaches us to pray and how he teaches us to be faithful through all times, good and bad. Thank you, Father, that you remind us that you hear our prayers and that we are loved. Thank you for answering our prayers. I pray that we will each take to heart what we learn here and that we will apply it to our everyday lives. I just ask, Father, that you keep us safe and healthy in the coming days, and I pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, ladies, never forget, God loves you. Jesus loves you. I love you. Love you. Bye.